Let us pray together. Be with us this morning, God. Quiet our hearts. May our spirits be still that we might hear from you. Amen. As we pick up today's story, Jesus has been in the wilderness for 40 days. 40 days of fasting and praying and depending on God. He's tired, he's hungry, and he's vulnerable. Suddenly the devil appears and begins taunting Jesus, trying to tempt him and deceive him. And ultimately he leads Jesus up to a high vantage. He shows him all the kingdoms of the world, as the text says. And he tells Jesus that all this can be his, all the world's glory and all authority therein, if only Jesus will bow down and worship him. And Jesus, tired, hungry, and vulnerable, somehow resists him. And he responds, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Numerous miracles are attested to Jesus, or accounted to Jesus, attributed to Jesus. There's an A word I was looking for there in the New Testament. Things like turning water into wine and multiplying fish and making blind people see. But in many ways, I see this as being the most significant miracle Jesus performed in his earthly ministry. Because look again at what the devil's offering. On the surface, it appears he's offering Jesus decadence and fortune and fame and pleasure. And certainly, each of these things attends the offer. But these are not the real temptation. No, the real temptation is far more alluring, far more seductive than all of that. The real temptation is power. Or more specifically, the real temptation is the illusion of control that comes with power. I want us to think for just a moment about control. As human beings, we crave it. We contrive to get it. We manipulate when we fear we can't have it. And most of the time, we aren't even aware we're doing it. And we do it for a simple reason. We do it because feeling in control helps us forget that we're not really in control at all. Because let's look at the reality. The truth is we are finite and contingent, vapor appearing for a moment before passing away forever. And deep down we know that no amount of money, no level of success, no degree of notoriety can change this. It's the most basic brute fact of human existence but we want to pretend like it's not even there and thus we seek control because feeling in control helps us temporarily forget that we're never really in control at all it's an impulse as old as humanity itself a virus hardwired right into the system and according to the biblical story, here's why. Because we who were created by God want nothing more than to be God ourselves. Because we who are utterly contingent want to be, as Ralph Waldo Emerson would have it, self-reliant. Like Frank Sinatra, we want to do it our way. And that's why what Jesus does in the wilderness is nothing short of a miracle. Because instead of doing it his way, which rest assured in his humanness was most certainly what he wanted to do, instead of doing it his way, he chose to do it God's way. And to recall last week's sermon, in so doing, he thereby became the first human being to actually be human. Human in the way we were designed to be. This is an important thing for us to consider, particularly today, because today marks the first Sunday in Lent, a season preparing us for the joy and the celebration of Easter. 
But unlike Easter, Lent is not a time for celebration. It's instead a time for sober reflection. A time for taking a close look at who we are as human beings. Both who we currently are, as well as who we are supposed to be. Because here's the thing. Unlike Jesus, who we currently are is not who we are supposed to be. And deep down we know this. We aren't certain what it is we are supposed to be, but we all sense that whatever it is, we somehow just aren't quite it. Do you know what I mean? It's a universal feeling across all time and culture. And different religions and different philosophies have given different explanations for why it exists. Eastern religions say it's because we don't accept our unity with all things. Greek philosophy says it's because we don't accept our place in the structure, the order of reality. Scientific materialism says it's because we don't accept ourselves as being mere animals. But according to the Christian story, here's why it exists. Because rather than being accidental byproducts of nature and chance, we are instead designed to be something specific designed to be someone specific and we're specifically designed to depend on God and we don't for to depend on God is to realize that the world doesn't center around us to depend on God is to realize that all that exists exists because God created to depend on God is to realize that all we have, from things to relationships to the very air we breathe, we have only because God created them and gifted them to us. And depending on God naturally leads to gratefulness and humility and love, while depending on ourselves naturally leads to the desire for power and prestige and control. And as Christianity teaches, from the earliest days, humankind has looked to itself for meaning and purpose. And we need to look no further than ourselves to recognize that we continue to do this right up to this very moment. Because it's how we want things to work. And that's natural. But here's the problem with it. It defies the very design for humanity. It runs contrary to the system's wiring. And therefore, it issues in that universal feeling, that feeling that we all somehow have that we're not quite who we're supposed to be. And that feeling, though we don't often recognize it as such, that feeling is a subtle form of persistent guilt. And naturally, we don't like it. It doesn't feel good. So guess what we try to do to drown it out? We seek more power, and we seek more control. It's a vicious cycle. It's like the band the Avett Brothers put it. The more I have, the more I think I'm almost where I need to be. If only I could get a little more. It's insanity. But that's the way we feel about control. It's both the cause of and the supposed solution to that universal human anxiety. It's like a narcotic in that way, numbing us from what otherwise throbs at our core, but all the while perpetuating our desire for more. And so we accumulate and exclude and neglect and divide. We snub and exploit and manipulate and resent all for control, most often not even realizing that's the reason. Control of ourselves, control of others, control of our lives, control of all the kingdoms of the world. Which brings us back one final time to Jesus in the wilderness. Had Jesus accepted that offer, he wouldn't have just been bowing down to Satan. 
Had Jesus accepted that offer, he would have been bowing down to what Satan represents, which is the desire, as the Bible says, to be like the Most High, the desire to be self-reliant, the desire to be independent, the desire to be in control. That's why Lent begins by asking us to look at this specific story, this story of Jesus in the wilderness. Because in this story, we see Jesus very much like ourselves, tired and hungry and vulnerable. But then again, also in this story, we see something else in Jesus too. We also see in him who we are not, yet who we are also somehow supposed to be. And thus, Lent begins by asking us to take into account, to examine, to reflect on the chasm that yawns between who we are now and who we are supposed to be. And it thus asks us to confess our failure for not living up to this, our design. It asks us to confess our arrogance for insisting on doing it our way. It asks us to confess our folly for pretending to ever really be in control. You see, Lent reminds us that the resurrection means nothing if we don't come face to face with the human arrogance and pride and presumption that led Christ to the cross in the first place. It reminds us that if we haven't come face to face with what we need saving from, we can't really know what it means to say Jesus saves. It reminds us that if we haven't come face to face with ourselves, we can't expect God to come face to face with us. Or as C.S. Lewis puts it, how can God meet us face to face until we have faces? a haunting line, a haunting question. This Lent, might we come to have faces? Might we come to see who we currently are in contrast to who we were designed to be? Might we come to depend more on God and less on ourselves? Might we finally surrender the age-old desire to control all the kingdoms of the world.